Um, I don't fully understand the distinction between the who and the what that you refer to. Can you explain that a bit? Theosis does not mean that you replace God. That God ceases to exist. Father, Son, or Holy Spirit cease to exist and you take their place. But it become, means you become, by God's love, what God is. You become fully God without replacing God. Thus, you become the what without replacing the who. Marina, would you like to add anything about theosis? It's coming tomorrow. Good. <laughs> Point out the question if I can't see the hand. I can see that hand. Um, looking at it from a practical point and, and taking this into the world, if you are able to take off your mask and, and, and be a true person, how receptive do you think other people are who are still wearing their masks will be to it. Can they identify that in yourself? I can put this on like this. I can put this on like this. Mm. I can put this on like this. I can put this on like this. Not all of us are always wearing our masks in the same position. And not everybody in the world is wearing a mask in the same degree. My parish is right in the throbbing heart of commercial London. I face the secular world all the time. I don't have the luxury of creating a little monastery of the worst possible stereotype in which, you know, everybody is always equally conscious, equally aware. I face people wandering in from Liverpool Street Station all the time. So I don't preach to the converted. I raise questions. I disturb. I force people, if they're paying attention, I can't guarantee that they will, to question themselves and wonder, am I wearing a mask? I challenge the masks. When you are engaging with actual or potential unbelievers, you have to gauge where they are. And they won't always be in the same position, just as the mask will always be in the same position. We all wear certain masks all the time. But hopefully we remember what our actual face looks like. Hopefully when we're able to take off the mask we wear in the pub or the classroom or the office or something, we can actually see our own face in the mirror. The, we are lost only when we mistake the mask for our face. You live in the, in the middle of a city, people wear masks all the time. Urban people live so closely together and there's so much rivalry just for existence that they wear masks of defense all the time. So it depends. When I am preaching or serving before a completely mixed congregation over who, which I have no control whatsoever, I have no idea what masks they're wearing, but I know that they're wearing masks because they're frightened human beings, just like me. So I have to, in every encounter, see whether I can lift the mask. And maybe all that I can do is make that person ask the question, am I wearing a mask? Or do I have a real face? This is like saying, how do you love someone? You love that particular person. You don't just love in general. You have to love, you have to show strong, dramatic, bold love towards that particular person insofar as you can, insofar as you know them as a person. You can't have one rule applies to all circumstances, especially when it comes to something as subtle as people's means of self-defense. However, I must say that I have a couple of beggar friends, <coughs> they're homeless people in the neighborhood, that I don't just give alms to. I don't have a great deal of money, so I give them some alms, but I, sit, I stand there and talk to them for a while. And I know them by name, and they know me by name, and they know who I am. And they don't know I don't have a lot of money, and I can't always pay for their room at the night, overnight, and things like this. But I know their names. And sometimes I'm better able to have a real conversation without using our language, 
with one of them that I am plenty of fellow priests. Mm -hmm. In fact, many people know that I make this joke about the youth festival. Mm -hmm. If I have to be placed in a room with someone overnight, let it be any life form other than a fellow priest. Mm -hmm. um, there are, the fact that you're a communicant well, member of the Orthodox Church right. does not mean that you're consistently free of your mask. Okay. It just means that you're constantly reminded mm -hmm. that you should be wearing one 24 7. Mm -hmm. Any more? I know, yes. <laughs> so within that, there's obviously, uh, within the world we live in, there's this innate desire to put on um, a mask at times as we, obviously, we want to fit in in certain ways. We're, we're afraid very much of being, let's say, going into an office, for example, um, being the odd guy out, the odd man or woman out, so to speak. So we, we put on this mask without even thinking sometimes because we, we don't want to be bullied, we don't be, want to be ostracized and so forth. So my, my question would be, um, are there any situations where it might be valid to wear a mask or partially wear a mask? Uh, and um, if not, which I'm guessing is probably the answer, um, what can we do to... Where, where can we find that balance within our lives so that we can fit in without being, obviously, without being sort of the odd one out? Ask anyone who grew up under a totalitarian system, and they'll know, they'll tell you, if they survived intact as people, that when you are in a situation in which you are not safe, you always wear a mask, but you deliberately wear a mask. You learn how to deceive. You learn how to tell the authorities what you need to tell the authorities so you and your loved ones are safe. You learn how to cheat the world. One of the most intriguing and often disturbing parables of our Lord is the parable of the unjust steward who cheats his master financially and yet the master praises him for his wit in doing so, for covering his tracks. In a fallen world, not everyone is honest. Very few people are honest. Very few of us are ever honest 100% of the time. We have to coexist in a fallen world. We are on a battlefield. We are existing on a battlefield. So you have to learn who you can trust and who you can't trust. You can't act like every single person in your life has an equal relationship of intimate honesty with you. You have to choose who your friends are. You can't just act as though all your colleagues are inevitably your friends. A man should have very few friends, or else friendship means nothing. And he should love very few, if not only one, or love means nothing. So, yes, there are infinite number of, of occasions on which I wear a mask, Maybe all of this is a mask that also reveals my actual face. Maybe it's a paradoxical mask. It isn't my everyday clothing. It's a uniform. A uniform is a mask, but a uniform is a mask that indicates an authority for the sake of other people. That's what all uniforms are. And when you work in a system that is by its nature impersonal, you have to wear a mask. Of course you have to wear a mask. But when you come home and you look in a mirror or you look at the face of a loved one, you take off that mask. You know who you can trust. And when the only, the, 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 you dehumanize, not because you wear the masks of survival in an unjust, du du duplicitous, fallen world, but because you keep them on. You don't know when to take them off. You have to discern as an adult who you can trust and who you can't trust. And among those that you can trust, you remove that mask. That's the sign that you trust them. You make yourself vulnerable. How can you love without being vulnerable? And the persons who chose that they're not worthy of your trust will betray you. That's another part of being an adult being betrayed by people you thought you could trust. But in terms of your in interaction with the anonymous world, let's call it the anonymous world, 
We're always wearing masks. You can't love the anonymous world. It isn't human. Individuals in it may be human, but in itself it isn't. He who loved, if anyone loves the world, says the Apostle John, the love of God is not in him. The world does not mean everything physically out there. It means that faceless collective entity that does not allow for personhood. And before that, you wear a mask. And he, yes, please. Where does the meaning to us as Christians not being like loving thy neighbor as yourself and being afraid of nothing and all this concept of having Christ with us and the work of you know, conquest and all these concepts? Like they contradict to what you just said in a way, no? Okay. Nobody, including your Lord Jesus Christ, says that you have nothing to be afraid of. Behold, I send you out a sheep among wolves. Sheep among wolves has a lot to be afraid of. But, he says, I will be with you. He doesn't tell the martyrs, you are not to be afraid when you're tortured, when you're in prison, when you're falsely accused, when you're killed. He says, I will be with you. I will be tortured with you. I will be in prison with you. So you are not to be afraid in the sense that you are completely desperate. There's nobody there. There's nobody in heaven or on earth. He is always there. But if he himself bleeds blood in the garden, his counsel not to be afraid does not mean you don't bleed blood. God himself is afraid. He suffers fear in the garden because he's a full human being. And no full human being faces torture and death without fear. He wouldn't be a human being otherwise, and we would be docetist heretics. Now, as to your neighbor, there's one parable in the gospel that tells you who your neighbor is. That's not just anybody you encounter. That's the man fallen among thieves. He's a Samaritan, in the, in, or rather a Samaritan comes along and possibly finds a Judean, and Samaritans and Judeans don't like each other. But this is someone who is vulnerable and crying out in pain. Your neighbor is the person who needs you. It isn't just everybody you encounter. Everybody you encounter is a body. Every person you know might be your neighbor. So we must always bear in mind what Christ says to his apostles about being harmless, wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And St. Cyprian makes this point at the beginning of the unity of the Catholic Church. We are to go out into the world without intending to destroy or maim harmless as doves. But we are to be as wise as serpents because the serpent knows how to protect its head. Christianity does not mean naivete. Yes? I have a question. Right in front of me. It is uh, communion related. Um, we are taught that God is love and healing, and through communion we take God. It's not just symbolic, it's real flesh and blood. But I saw in some churches they are giving communion after this COVID situation with many spoons or with the same spoon, but it's disinfected in uh, hot water. What do you think about this? For me, I think it's a big insult to God, but I, I really need another opinion because I might be wrong. Okay. Every bishop in this country knows where I live and knows who I am, and so let every KGB and Securitate and etc. etc. hunt me down. <laughs> I'm speaking as an adult who is also a priest to adults. And I'm not going to pretend that I also don't think that there is something blasphemous in saying you're going to die from life. I understand people who are afraid. I am afraid. I'm afraid of a million things. Like most actors, I'm a compensated introvert. I'm actually extremely shy and introverted, but circumstances have made me a public person, so I perform on a stage. I know how obsessional it can become to be afraid of dying of a disease you don't understand. In fact, Ralph Waldo Emerson said that all fear comes from ignorance. What you don't know, you start imagining things about based on what you do know about it or what you think you know about it. I personally 
thank God, never had to get into a fight with my bishop, uh, criticize him a lot, but I never had to get into a fight with my bishop over plastic disposable cups or disposable spoons or stuff like this. When he didn't want us to give communion to people, we didn't give communion to people. We didn't sort of give them half communion. I personally recoil in horror from halfway measures. It's completely contrary to my temperament as a priest. You do it or you don't do it. You don't just sort of half do it. And I guess, theologically, I find it repugnant to believe that you're going to die from the body and blood of Christ. The body and blood of Christ is the food of immortality. That is not just used by one father, but by many. But at the same token, I understand that there are priests and bishops who were very afraid during this lockdown and didn't understand what was going on and on the part, on, in, the, in the interest of not unwittingly causing someone to get sick and die, would do what they did. So, in, I live streamed during all three lockdowns and got quite a following, including in Canada and Australia and places. And one of the points I made in my final, I, I would speak into the camera, right before the camera went off, I would speak into the camera and I said, I'm not looking for a fight with any of you out there, so don't look for a fight with me. I am acting in conscience. I'm acting according to the rules. I'm not going to express my opinion about whether you, what you're doing, so don't you dare try to hunt me down, because I'm not hunting you down. However, I can tell you, because during that lockdown, I was, the first lockdown, I was getting phone calls from fellow priests or their wives three or four times a week because it had such a disastrous impact on the conscience of Orthodox people. It threw people into the most fundamental agonies of conscience because even the USSR did not dictate what you do inside a church. They just closed down the number of churches and left very few open. I'm telling you where my conscience stood. I'm not going to judge someone else's conscience. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. How do I resuscitate mm -hmm. um, epectasis, or this intense thirst for God, mm -hmm. within me? And how does this um, relate to the love I express towards others? You resuscitate it by expressing that love towards others. I bit off a lot this evening because I wanted to give you something of substance that went straight to the most fundamental issues. We could go on forever talking about how you do it, but I'm not you, and I don't love the people you love. I don't know the people you love. So I can't tell you how, but I can tell you that if you tap in in yourself, to who or what you really love, that will resuscitate, if you want to say it, your epectasis towards God. He who does not love the neighbor, his brother, whom he sees, how can he love God that he does not see? You can't love God as an abstraction, but you can get to know God by recognizing the image of God in someone else, even something else. Maybe it's a mouse, maybe it's a tree, Maybe it's something, some icon in the world. But you can, your love for God can grow wherever you love someone or something until it hurts. Thank you. That's love. It costs. But that was any more? That was brilliant theology. Glory to God. Any, any more? Is any, any... Questions or yes, yes, one more. Uh, so, if we cannot help someone to to desire the to desire and to love uh, the right object in the right way, should we at least uh, try to uh, help this person to love and desire, even if it means uh, this person may desire and love in a wrong way? It depends on how wrong. Okay. Basically. I get, I get a lot of flack for this because people don't appreciate I didn't grow up in a monastery 
or as someone who didn't know anything about the world on the, on the, mo the day that I was ordained priest. I'd been around the block. And I didn't, and that's why I have no time for pussyfooting about the faith. I have no time for this sort of nice, sweet, gentle, innocent sort of thing about the faith. The faith is not about making bad men good, it's about making dead men alive. That's Christianity. So, if I see someone in my very young congregation about to make a mistake, I have to have the maturity to know how big is the mistake. If it's a mistake that they have to go through in order to learn something about life, I have to be a big enough father to let them go through it. Not just to grab the child because, by God, the child might make a mistake. The child's going to make a mistake whether you grab them or not. But if the mistake is going to have repercussions so that affect completely innocent people, innocent bystanders, or affect that person put a wound in that person's soul that he's going to spend the next 50 years recovering from, I will warn them. I won't just say, no, 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 because an adult doesn't speak to an adult that way. I will say, do you realize that this could happen and take it from someone to whom it happened? So you have to use discernment because everybody is different and you have to give an adult, even a very young adult, the opportunity to make mistakes. Is that, am I, how much overtime am I? You still have time for one or two more questions. Okay, uh, okay. I can't even see my watch, let alone any clock. Or something. Maybe everyone is so talked out now. <laughs> you've done a really good job, man. What? Oh, okay. you've, done a <clears throat> you've done a really good job, man. <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> Came from experience. I don't, I don't, I don't. I, I mean, when I'm talking about the faith and quoting a bunch of fathers and modern thinkers and Gregory of Nyssa and such, they're, 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 I have to use a degree of technical language. I try to keep it to a minimum. Mm. But the point is, what I'm talking about is lived experience. It's lived experience. And it only sounds abstract if you haven't lived it, if you haven't paid the price for it. But how can you explain to someone who's never been in love what it is to be in love with someone? How can you explain to someone who's never had a child what it is to have a child? There are things in life you have to go through to be to have the right to talk about them. In fact, to quote a favorite film of mine, 20 cannot hear what 40 has to say. 20 has to become 40 first. That's as much as good job. That is as much as we can as we can take for the early time. I figure that's as much as you can take. Anyway, go to, go 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 enjoy the, the beach farm with you. I'm going to bed.